said. I had to make sure we record this because somebody gonna be mad. <laughs> right. Repeat that answer for me again. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ had forgiven our sins. Good man. I appreciate you, my brother. Point blank, period. Now, can we expand on that? Of course we can. So let's do it. Let's see. Da, da, da. Bam. All right. So if you put in Google right now, define gospel, okay? Check it out. It's going to say the teaching or revelation, well, revelation, revelation of Christ, <laughs> okay? And then I like this one right here. It says a thing that is absolutely true. Okay, that's powerful to, to look. You know, there's more that goes down further that still includes the same thing, but these two right here, they hit home, right? And what you said as well, it is the good news. Now, what makes good news so good? The good news that makes the good news so good is the fact, the reality that there's bad news, right? When a person preaches the gospel, that means that I have to preach the entire truth. There's a reason why the good news is so good, because the bad news is profoundly terrible. The bad news is there is a God that exists, and I have offended that God. I have offended a holy, a righteous, and a just God who demands justice for the, the things that we have said and done that have displeased him, right? <laughs> That's point blank period. Nobody wants to look at God like that. We want to look at him as uh, the way maker. We want to look at him as the lawyer in the courtroom or, or the doctor in my sick bed, right? And he's all of that, but he's also a just God who's serious about sin and misleading others, right? And destruction that you cause in your own life by going against him, right? And so because the consequences are so dire for man after they leave this earth, to leave without a relationship in Christ because the, the consequences were so dire. God, because he loved us so much, did something. And that thing that he did is what's caught up and wrapped up in this thing as we known as the gospel or the good news. And so this is what we try to share with men to help them to understand, yo, you don't even realize it, but you're an enemy of God. But God loves you and he takes no pleasure in and chastising you. He takes no pleasure in seeing you die. He takes no pleasure in none of that. But what he does take pleasure in is seeing a, a broken and repent, repenting heart, a heart that wants to turn around and say, I'm sorry. I want to do a 180 from the sin that I'm looking at. I want to turn from that and I want to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what pleases God. And so we want to make sure that we take advantage of the gospel message. It is good news that is given freely, right? Simply because God wants you at his table. He wants to make a place for you with him in heaven. And he wants to forgive you of your sins and no longer be enemies and separated from you. He wants to be together and reconciled, right? And that can only come through this one man who is the God man named Jesus Christ. All right, so we'll keep moving. Any questions or thoughts so far? Am I going too fast? Oh, no, you're good. Okay, all right. As long as, long as y'all are good, we'll be good. All right, let's move forward. Bam. Icebreaker number two. Do you think the writers of the Gospels felt it important to write them? If so, why? I'm going to get this to say it. Go ahead, say it. Talk to me, bro. <laughs> I knew uh all right so these are the writers of the gospel felt it was important to write them up so uh I felt like they felt like it was important to write down the teachings and the miracles that Christ has performed so that it could be something that was recorded for future generations to come so they could have something to look back on and something to lean on I, I guess I ain't no guessing that's it that's it Matthew 28 Right, the last three verses, I believe it's 18 through 20. You look, um, and it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. This is Christ's final command. Go ye therefore mm -hmm. and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them all the things that I taught you, right? Teaching them all the things that I taught you. Yo, it was only two of the four people who wrote the gospels that actually walked with Jesus. There was Matthew, who was a tax collector, and then there was John, right? The book of Luke, the gospel of Luke was written by a physician, Luke, who actually traveled with Paul. And that guy was a very avid and thorough researcher. And he researched Christ's life, his pedigree, right? He went on back to see who was his mama's mama and, and back and further, further than that, right? And wrote all that down. And uh, he went back and extensively researched and presented the gospel message in a way like none other. But he was a contemporary of Paul, right? But then Mark, Mark was a, a contemporary. He was under uh, Peter. Who we know Peter was walking, he didn't want to pull out the sword and cut the man ear off when the cats ran up on Jesus, right? And he got his message from Peter. And so these are like accounts that come to you from men who either walk with him or they were connected with the person who walked with Christ, right? And they brought forth this message because they understood the Great Commission to teach them all the things that I taught you. And the Lord said, Lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. Right. So, yes, they thought it was important. It's crucial. And not only that, God has preserved his word since the ink dried on the paper. Right. <laughs> he has. And so from 2000 years ago, we still have the words that still affect us to this day. All right. Good answer. Appreciate you. Questions, comments, thoughts, criticisms. Let's keep moving. Bam. Icebreaker number three. Sherelle or Jay Howe, whichever one of y'all are there, talk to me. What is a heresy? I heard some mumbling, but it was real low. Okay. Since I don't hear them, let's open it up to the floor. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Nobody want to take a stab at it? Hello? Can you hear me? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hey. Hey. Good evening. My, uh, Good evening. Mute, my mute button was giving me a hard time. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, I think you can get it, but it's okay. <laughs> it's user error, I guess. Oh, uh, Anyway. Um, heresy is like, um, it's, I guess it's more so of a contradiction um, of the word or something that's invalidating or something along those lines. You are correct. You are hitting it correctly, okay? I'm going to give you guys a definition, and then I'm going to explain it a bit more thoroughly, okay? So that's, that's a good answer, Sherelle. Okay. Heresy, okay? With regards to religion, is any belief or practice that goes against the official position of the church is considered heretical. Now, I want to put some emphasis on this, okay? Every church that exists does not follow God's word, okay? There are a lot of churches that claim to be churches, but they're really not, okay? This is why the Bible says that we need to ensure that we are, uh, we're in God's word so that I, we, we can make sure we don't make any mistakes, okay? That we're not fooled by heretical teaching, okay? Um, so when you look at this, when it says the church's position, um, sorry, send a message. Da, 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 da. All right, so when you look at, uh, okay, gotcha. The church's position, the church has to make sure it lines up with God's word. Right? Because the church itself could be heretical. <laughs> right? Anything that goes against or says that it teaches and is that it is, it is uh, a, represent, a representation of Jesus Christ and what he teaches and what's in his word. Right? If they are the opposite of that and they're saying something that's opposite of what's in the Bible, that's, that's an error. That's called heresy. Right? And we want to make sure that when it comes to Jesus, we know what we're talking about. Now, that thought alone can make people kind of back up and be like, well, I, I'm scared to talk to people or witness because I, I, I don't want to say nothing wrong. 
Well, that means speak on what you know. And what you don't know, say, hey, look, I'll be back. I'm going to come back and I'm going to answer that question because I'm not sure. As a Christian that witnesses, there is absolutely no shame or no crime in saying, I don't know. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. It's nothing to be ashamed of. If anything, that's a growing opportunity for you. Then now I'm going to go forward. I'm going to research it. And now I'm going to be excited once I find the answer and I can share with you as well. Okay. So don't let the fact that you don't want to be a heretic stop you from sharing what you do know confidently about Christ. Okay, that's important. Most people who practice heresy are intentionally, intentionally misleading people because they're trying to take advantage of other people for a particular benefit that they see. Okay, and we want to ensure that we're not those people. So let's keep moving forward. Bam. Now here go a real one right here. Here go a real one. I, I even put a big paragraph out there for y'all, okay? A man preaches a message that sounds solid. He speaks on topics that make you feel encouraged and uplifted, okay? So we bring it to bed. A man is in church. He come into church. And when he come into church, there's a man behind a pool pit. And he's preaching, boy. I mean, he going in, right? And he touching your very soul with what he's saying. You're like, mm, I feel that, right? You feel encouraged and uplifted. It feels like God is speaking mightily through him. He speaks on Jesus and how great he was, right? He says, Jesus is the greatest man that ever lived. And there is no man who will ever be as great. He says, Jesus is a miracle worker a way maker, a doctor when you're sick and will answer your prayers. Then proceeds to say, Jesus might not be God, but I'll sure praise him like he was God. The church goes crazy. The musicians play loud and people begin dancing and praising the Lord. Does anything this man says make you want to praise the Lord or is there a problem with anything he says? There's a big problem. <laughs> Uh-oh, talk to me. What's the big problem? Jesus, God. Why, why would he not be God? Mm, you found it. Jackpot, right? Jackpot. What I put in green right there. Jesus might not be God, but I'll sure praise him like he was God. That's a problem. Because there are many people who can make you feel good like this. There are many people who will talk about your day-to-day -day life and your situations and all you need is God and this and that and boom, boom, boom. But they do not teach that Jesus Christ himself is God. I don't care how well the church looks. I don't care how great the poor people looks. I don't care how great that man looks dressed in that suit. I don't care about his ability to get out and enunciate and share and speak. If that man says anything that goes against the deity of Christ, anything, if he tries to belittle him and make him sound like he's just a man, that's heresy. That's a problem. You get up and you walk out that church, right? Because this man is leading people to hell. And that's dangerous. Remember, Christ is the main ingredient. He is everything. If you do not have Christ, you don't have a Bible. If you do not have Christ, you don't have a church. If you do not have Christ, you don't have salvation or eternal life. Jesus is everything. He's either everything or he's nothing. And just because people say they love God, right? Or oh, we need to pray. Oh yeah, Jesus got it. We have to make sure that we are talking about the same Jesus, right? Because if we're not talking about Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, who is God, who died and rose again and has all power, right? Who created everything and put everything together, who's more than just a man, who is 100% man and 100% God at the same time. If we're not talking about that person, then who are we talking about? This is what we need to see and understand. And we need to be confident in the God that we say we serve and that we worship. If Jesus is not everything, Jesus is nothing. 
okay? Good answer for icebreaker number four. All right, we're finna jump into the list. Any other questions, comments, thoughts, criticisms, anything before we proceed? All right, we're gonna keep it moving. Bam. All right, so today's scripture is going to come from Colossians chapter one, verses 15 through 18. We will not get through the entire passage, okay? I purposely put a pin in it and stopped at a certain place so that we can marinate on something and we can pick back up next week uh, with, with a clear mind, an empty mind that we can put something in, okay? So, any, many, many, mo. Who wants to be a reader today? Don't everybody speak up all at one time. Um, I don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. You're so kind. I appreciate you. <laughs> Okay. I, am I ready to start? Right, I can start anytime. Uh, yes, sir, please. Okay. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions and or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Preeminence. Preeminence, yes. Yeah, I appreciate you, my man. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Paul said a mouthful right here. He said a mouthful. And what we're going to do is we're going to go line by line. We're going to start cutting this thing up so that we can get a better and more thorough understanding of the God that we say that we worship, right? We live in a day and age where we have access to the Bible and tools and resources more than any other person in human history, right? If we want it, it's a click away. It's a click away, right? If we want it, but we're still ignorant about who Jesus is. It's not right. So today, we're going to spend time investigating what these words mean so that we can have a clearer view of who our Savior is, okay? So let's look at the first slide that we have. Things to remember. The first thing, he is the image of the invisible God, okay? He is the firstborn over all creation. He is the creator of all things. Jesus is before all things. Jesus is the glue of the galaxies. He holds everything together. Jesus is the head, leader of the church. He is the firstborn of the dead. Jesus is preeminent, okay? Now, I know I said some things in here that y'all gonna be kind of like, wait, what that mean? I don't know what that? I'm glad you got that mentality because we're gonna lead up to these things and we're going to make them clear, okay? Uh, again, so that we can have a thorough understanding of who Christ is. And when we open up our mouths to speak, we could be like, uh-uh, no, that ain't right. Because scripture says right here that this is who Christ is and, and Christ is speaking for himself, all right? So let's look at the first one again. Bam. The image of the invisible God. The word image comes from a Greek word we get the word icon from. Okay. The Greek word is icon, but it's spelled differently. Okay. And that word means a likeness, literally a statue, a profile, or a representation or resemblance, right? So when you look at God, you're looking at what we see as an, an icon. When you look at Christ, you see like an icon that leads to, to God, right? Think about it. And you're going to see it again on my notes. I'm just going to go ahead and say it out, out top. When you get on your computer and you want a certain program to run, what do you do? You click on what? You click on that icon. Icon or app, if that's what y'all want to call it. But the, the app has something that looks like an icon that opens up the grand scheme of everything, right? 
when you can't find it, you searching in your folders and something. If it ain't there like it's supposed to be, you're like, where it go? It's, it's here, right? You're looking everywhere for it because you know that getting access to it without double clicking that icon is almost impossible for you. You got to find what leads to it. Christ is the icon that leads to God. Why? Because he is God. All right? Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. Let's move forward. Bam. The image of the invisible God, part two. Jesus Christ is the perfect image, the exact likeness of God, and is in the very form of God and has been so from all of eternity, okay? So what we need to understand is that Jesus is God and has been God and has never ceased being God and he will forever be God, okay? But when he came on the earth, he came as that icon so that we can see the image of God in physical form. That's what you look at when you see Christ. In this way, Paul, who was the writer of his book, the Colossians, illustrates that Jesus is the representation and manifestation of God. Jesus is the real icon, like that of your computer. If you double click on him, which is to repent and believe on him, then you will have access to God the Father, God the Son, and God's Holy Spirit. Without coming to Jesus, you have no access to God because Jesus is God. Okay? And so I don't want you to take my word for it. Dun, dun, dun. Let's find some scriptures, shall we? Let's see. Da, 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 da. Let's pick on Joseph. Joseph, if you don't mind, <laughs> if you're in a position to do it, please pull up Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Mike, if you don't mind, I want you to find John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Let me see what we got on my line over here. Sandra, if you don't mind, I want you to find John chapter 1, verse 14. And when you guys got it, let me know. Until then, I'm going to do this real quick because somebody else is trying to get in. Da, 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 da. Let's see. He is the name of the Huh? All right, I got it. Got it. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Who got John uh, 1, 1 through 3? That one and da, 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 da. Oh, okay, got you. Oh, ba, 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 let's see. Hey, Zenobia. Uh, uh, uh. Zenobia. Since you ran the out button the fast enough. <laughs> there you go. You are. Okay. <laughs> Zenobia, let me get you to get. Hello. See, I gave Sandra John 1, 1 through 3. Zenobia, let me get you to get John 1, 1 through 3. And don't worry, guys, if you don't have your Bibles with you, you can always look it up on your phone. It'll still work. Or your computer, whichever one it is. And if you think I ain't gonna pick on you, best believe it. I'm gonna call you. <laughs> <laughs> so who got John 1 and 14? I gave that to who? Nobody knows. I caught on Joseph. Michael, yo, Michael. Didn't I give oh. you John? Which oh, one did I give? Uh, um I thought you gave me John chapter one to three, but I, I could take the, the last one. It's okay, fine. okay. Sure. Take it. Sorry, see, I, I just start writing stuff down. I'm getting old, man. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. All right. So, Joseph, we will start with you, sir. Would you mind reading that for us, please? Sure. Uh, this is the NIV. Uh, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, in, who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used 
to his own advantage. Rather, okay. he made himself nothing. Sorry. Go ahead. No, you can forgive me. I want you to go back one line. Who what? He said being in what with God? Uh equality with God. Aha. Okay. So tell me something. We're gonna pause right there. What man do you know can say that he's equal with God? Uh no one currently on earth. Uh, nobody. Yeah. Nobody. <laughs> the only person who can equally say that they are on the same part with God is God himself. Because God is so far out of our league, right? So we're speaking about Christ here in Philippians. Paul is writing the letter to the Philippians, and he's speaking about the character, right? And how we should imitate Christ, right? By having humility. And what you were reading was, he's saying, even though Jesus knew he was God, he was equal with God because he is God, right? He didn't lord it around like, yeah, I'm God, y'all serve me. No, he was, <laughs> and he was a servant. He was humble. Think about it. God being humble, right? Our point, though, is the fact that we're pointing to the part that says that Jesus is God. Does that make sense to y'all? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Code. Sherelle, you still there or you, you, you messing with the kids? All of the above, but I'm here. I am learning <laughs> multitask. <laughs> I, at least you're honest, right? <laughs> All right. So we'll stop you right there. I appreciate you, my brother. All right. Now, John 1, 1 through 3. This one you have to really listen in on, okay? Zeno, you got me? Earth is Zenobia. I don't know what Zenobia is. She there, hello, wait. Her mic is not muted. Zenobia. Yeah. Can you hear me? There we go. Now I can hear you. Perfect. <laughs> All right. You might read I don't John. Understand. My headphone's not even working. Can you hear me? Yep. I can hear you good. You might read John 1, 1 through 3, 4. <laughs> was already there the word she went in and out on us can y'all hear me better now now we can hear you much better clear okay good okay in the beginning the word was already there the word was with god the word was god he was with God from the beginning, God made all things through the word. God did not make anything without him. Okay. So in the beginning was the word, right? Boom. The word was with God and the word was God. So we see two different individuals here, but it's saying that both of them are God. And it say God with an S. It said God, G-O-D. Okay. It's not more than one. Now, three persons of it will be called the Trinity, but there's still only one God. You can't explain that, right? It's a strange myth. No man explained it. They might try to give you examples like, oh, well, one's air and one's ice and one's water. No, bro, you're missing it. <laughs> That's three different Is forms Is that when we walk out the church again? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you're going to walk out the church on that one, right? God, number one, we can't explain God. It's impossible. You can't do it, right? But what we can do is say what God says about himself. So again, what she's saying is, in the beginning, right? Before there was an earth, before there was a universe, before there were stars, before there was heaven, in the beginning, before God said, let there be this, let there be that, in the beginning, was the word. The word was with God, right? When you're with somebody, that means it's more than one, right? The word was with God, and the word was God. He, okay, we're going to personify it now. The word is not just like literal, it's a person. He was with God in the beginning, okay? This is what we're seeing in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. 
But not only that, it said that he made everything and there was nothing that was made that wasn't made by him. It was made by him and for him. Who was that him? The word. Now, John chapter one, verse 14. Mr. Michael, if you don't mind reading that for me, please. Yes, sir. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Wow. Wait, wait, wait. The word became what? The word became flesh and dwelt Ooh. among us. So wait, wait, wait. Flesh. You mean like this? Like skin? Flesh? Mm -hmm. So the word became a man, is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and the word not only became a man, but the writer John said, and we have seen him. We have beheld him, right? And we understand that he is the only begotten of the Father, right? That means that, that something came forth from God, right? God himself gave himself and put skin upon himself to come down here so that man can see him. So John is saying, I have seen God, right? But I've also seen the Son of God. Easy. Jesus is the Son of God. Nobody can explain it. We won't understand until we start face to face. But that's where faith comes. Did know that in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it ever sit back and try to explain or convince you that God is real. It never does. When you open up Genesis chapter one, it says in the beginning, God, bam, done, right? <laughs> it doesn't say there was a force that existed some thousands of years ago, eons, and, and it came together and it became, no, it doesn't try to explain anything. It just says in the beginning, God, and that's it. Because God has put something in the very nature of every human being for them to understand and realize there is something and someone greater than me that exists. Because everything that I see outside of here shows me that something is greater that exists. And that very thing on the inside creates an urgency for you to want to know more. And when you do, when you seek after God, God will reveal himself and you will now come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what happens. Problem is, many people don't really care to know Jesus for themselves. When they look at Christ and when they see who he is from the scriptures, they don't like what they see because that means they have to conform their life. That means that they have to live a life where there's actual purpose. When you become a Christian, you don't stop having the ability to do what you want to do. You can do things that are good and that are great because God made us to be great. But there are lines that God says don't cross. You can play so football. Be, oh, huh? I'm sorry. So will it be not necessarily what you do, but how you do it in a sense? Yes and no. So, okay. you know, God has, a lot of times God says, thou shalt not, right? He says, don't do this. Now, a lot of times when God says, don't do it, God doesn't mean that you can't ever do certain things in life. Sometimes God just says, not right now, right? This isn't the time for you to do this, right? So big, okay. easy. Huh? I said, okay, okay, I got you. Okay, bet, bet, bet. But there are certain things God just says don't do, point blank, period. Like lying, right? We, we know lying is wrong. If I if I kick door your house and I take a couple of things out of the, right? That's a no-no, right? <laughs> so again, there are a lot of things that God says, point blank, period, don't do that, right? And then point blank period, there are some things God says, don't do it because I'm trying to keep you for it later on. And you can enjoy it much better than you would now if you try to jump into it. That's what he's saying. Good question, though. Other questions and thoughts as we go along. All right, let's keep rolling. Check this out. This is another scripture. Jews understood something, and I want y'all to be able to see it too. John 10, 30 through 33. The words that in real are the ones that Jesus is saying. I and my father are one. 
Now, remember, Jesus has always claimed to be who he says to be. He is God and he, he is the son of God. Christ tells no lies. Okay. Verse 31 is crucial. Then the Jews took up stones. Right. They mad at Jesus because he's speaking the truth. Jesus answered them. Many good works I have shown you from my father. Talking about the father in heaven, right? For which of those do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work I stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. The Jews understood what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, me and the father are one. I'm God, just like God in heaven. The Father is God. That's what he's saying. And the Jews got mad at him. They wanted to kill him because they didn't want to believe or accept that truth. And that's major, man. They saw this man doing great work. They saw Jesus doing stuff that no man has the ability or capability to do at all. Jesus rose the dead on more than one occasion. Jesus uh, healed the stick. He opened the eyes of the blind. He fed over 5,000 people with just two fish and five loaves of bread. Yo, yo, they, saw, they saw him do that over and over and do so many things. And yet when he says, I'm God and I'm the son of God, they want to kill that man. In this same day and age, that was 2,000 years ago, many people hear, they understand, and they know what they're hearing is the truth. But they get mad. And they don't want nothing to do with just Jesus. They don't want nothing to do with God. Why? Why is it that they reject God? We'll answer that question a little bit later on. Y'all still with me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bet. So going back to Colossians 1, 15 through 18. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is telling you again, I'm the icon, I'm God. The firstborn over all creation. This is what we're gonna put our pen right here. We're gonna stop right here. The firstborn over all creation. Now I want you guys to understand something. We just saw something and I wanna bring it back because I want you guys to know it and understand again. Look, Jesus has always, existed there has never been a time in eternity or in humanity that christ did not exist you won't find it he's always been here so what in the world are they talking about when they say the firstborn over all creation what do you mean if he's always been here how could he be the firstborn? Was he born? Did, did, did God, uh, the father, link up with a woman and then they, he, as a, Christ was a spirit baby? What's going on? No. Let's look. Firstborn of all creation. Jesus has eternally been God. There was never a time when Jesus did not exist. Remember, Colossians 1 and 17 says that Jesus is before all things. There was a time when his bodily form was born on earth through the Virgin Mary, but there was never a time when Jesus, as God, never existed. So if Jesus always existed, what does it mean that he is the firstborn of all creation? Dun, dun, dun. Let's get back into some, some words here, okay? The Greek word for firstborn is prototokos, okay? Prototokos, which means chronologically firstborn, right? Some of y'all have brothers or sisters and you have a certain lineup in which you appeared on this earth, right? You might have a brother that's older than you, right? So chronologically, he, he, he's the firstborn, he's the oldest or a sister, right? But this word has more than one meaning. It also has another meaning. It also is defined as preeminent in position or rank, okay? What does the word preeminence mean? It means the fact of surpassing all others, superiority, right? 
for Christ is superior to everything that he has created. It's a term that they use back in the Jewish and the Greek times, right, for the particular culture. In both the Greek and Jewish culture, the firstborn was the ranking son who had received the rights of inheritance from his father, whether he was born first or not. Firstborn in this context clearly means the highest in rank, not first created. All right. So you know how we use slang for a whole bunch of different stuff. That's my T Jones, man. That's my T lady. What? That's my mama, dude. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like we use slang for a lot of, we use words to uh, come in context, or should I say, replace other words that have a particular meaning. And so when you look at this particular phrase that we're speaking of, firstborn, right? You look at that, that Greek word, prototokos, it's speaking about the priority and position of Christ above everything that he has created, okay? So let's go back to that, that, that verse. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, right? So you, you get caught up in that firstborn, but you don't look at over all creation. And when we go and we actually look at the definition of that word and the original Greek, you're seeing, yo, this is it. Now I get it. Okay, now what it's saying is he's over everything. Now, why is that important? Okay, it's important because there is a church that's out right now. You guys have probably seen the commercials when you were younger, uh, where you see like a little happy commercial about something in family. And at the end of the commercial, it says, this was presented to you by the Church of Latter-day Saints. Okay, probably ain't seen it in years, but... I used to see those commercials all the time as a kid growing up. Come to find out, this is the Mormon church, right? The Mormons believe in a form of Jesus, okay? So I'm going to hit you to something, and this is going to sound like crazy and confusing, but it's real, okay? This is what they believe. Now, this is, what I'm about to tell you now is a heresy. It's not the real deal. So don't get, get it twisted. I'm telling you, disclaimer, heresy, heresy, okay? The Mormons will tell you that they believe in Jesus Christ. What they won't tell you up front is they believe that Jesus is a created being. They believe that Jesus was born um, spiritually. Here's the quick story. God the Father lived on another planet and he kept the Ten Commandments so good that when he died, he was resurrected. And when he was resurrected, him and a few of his wives were resurrected and he was gifted with a planet, the planet Earth, okay? The Mormons believe that you're not able to create nothing, I mean, create something from nothing as God did when he said, let there be light. They believe that it was already in existence. So God the Father came to the Earth, he organized it, he had sex with his uh, his spiritual wife, and then Jesus was born, right? They say they believe in Jesus. They say Jesus was born. And then after Jesus was born, God the Father had another son called Lucifer. So they believe that Jesus and the devil, Lucifer, are brothers, and that all of us are brothers and sisters of Jesus as well. Strong. Um. That's dead wrong, okay? Again, disclaimer, it's a heresy. It's a heretical teaching. It's dead wrong. Christ was only born on the earth when he came through the Virgin Mary. But before Christ was born, he was still God and lived for eternity. He's always been here. The reason why we have these teachings the way that we do in this scripture and why it's so important that we identify the true Jesus Christ is because people who go to those particular churches, they're so nice. They're so kind. They'll speak to you nice, right? They feel like they're doing good deeds and they can explain well. They'll let you read from your Bible, right? They'll let you read from your Bible 
and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, you believe in Jesus? So do we. Why don't you guys come to our church? And, you know, we can have a great time. We'll have dinner and everything. And they're bringing you in to believe in a false Jesus. Christ is telling you he is God. And God has no birth. He has existed for eternity. He has the highest rank. He is the highest. There's nobody like him. But in the Mormon beliefs, the Church of Latter-day Saints, they believe that Jesus not only was a created being, but he's a lesser God. He's not equal to God the Father. And that's where the danger comes in. They also don't believe that salvation comes through faith, through Christ alone. They believe that after you do all that you can do to please God, then the grace of God comes in and you'll be saved. That's wrong. That's a heresy. This is why it's so important for you to read your Bibles. This is why it's so important for you to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ so that you won't be fooling yourself or allowing others to fool you. You have to know what Jesus says about himself so that you will not be misled. Because, I'm sorry, somebody say something? Okay, no. So again, you have to know what Christ says for himself so that you will not die and go to hell believing on the name of Jesus. You hear what I'm telling you? <laughs> I need you to catch that. You can believe in Jesus and still die and go to hell because you believe in the wrong one. Right? That's major. You got to understand that. That's major. All right. Any questions or thoughts before we move forward? Um, yeah, I got a question. So is salvation, is it an event that happens to you or is it like a process that you work towards? Okay, go ahead. Start your question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, is salvation an event or a process? It's actually both. Okay. okay. So salvation comes through Christ and Christ alone, right? Mm -hmm. We trust in Jesus Christ for eternal life and salvation. The Bible makes it plain that we have to hear the gospel message, okay? When we hear the gospel message, then the Bible makes it plain that the Holy Spirit convicts our heart. And it is the Father who is in heaven who draws us to come into salvation. I forgot the word that's used, but when you look at the word that they actually use, it's literally the Lord, the Father doing this. He's grabbing you. He's trying to drag you to come in. That's why that feeling on the inside that you have is telling you, I need to get saved. I need to get right. It's so strong because the father himself as a spiritual thing. He's pulling you and trying to bring you in. Right. Mm -hmm. When you make up your mind, when you make up your mind to say, OK, I have heard the gospel. I understand the gospel. I want to put my trust and my faith in nothing more than Christ Jesus. Bam. That's an event for you in your life when you make up your mind, right? And then the Bible makes it plain that once you come to Christ, once you repented of your sins, once you have turned around and you made up your mind that you will submit your life to Christ and that you want Christ to forgive all of your sins, right? You want him to be the savior of your soul and you ask the Lord to save you. Once you do this, once you come to Christ, then we call it a particular process. What you mean process? A process of you're continuously being saved. Does that mean you lose your salvation and you got to get saved again? No, that's not what I mean. I mean, with your salvation, God is working out your salvation and he's making you look more like him, right? Mm. Once a person gets saved, they cannot lose their salvation. Don't let anyone ever fool you and make you think so. Once you get saved, you cannot ever lose your salvation. God holds your salvation, not you. Scripture makes it plain. What can separate us from the love of God? Absolutely. He's your kids. And so he continues to uh, work on you, what we call a sanctification process, where basically he puts more of you in him. I mean, himself in you, right? 
and less of the sinful nature is going to be shown in you because you're continuously seeking the kingdom of God and you're doing your best to allow Christ to change your heart, right? The more you submit to him, the more he's changing your heart. The more you allow Christ to live his life through you, the more he changes your heart and make you more like him. So that's the process that continues to go on, right? Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Not a problem, my man. Any other questions or thoughts as we continue to proceed? Nothing we good? All right, cool, cool. I'm looking at the time. I want to make sure we don't go over our time today. But we are actually, believe it or not, close to the end of our, our stopping point. Okay? So moving forward, bam. For him, for by him. We actually start at verse 15 again. He is the image, Jesus. He is the image of the icon of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, right? And remember, we know that firstborn means that he's the highest in rank. Not that he was born, but he is the highest in rank above all creation. Remember, over all creation. In verse 16, for by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now, this is crucial because not only is they saying that Jesus is God, right? Not only does he make the invisible God visible when he showed up on the earth, not only is he only God and the visible God that they could see at that time, he's also the highest rank over all things that were created, right? Then it's giving him credit for all things that were created. For by him, all things were created. Remember I said that he is the glue of the galaxies. He keeps everything going. He said, let there be, and it's never stopped being ever since. We don't have to worry about the sun ever going out like a light bulb, do we? The sun will never go out until Christ says it's going to stop. It's going to keep on burning like the ball that it is in space. The stars will continue to twinkle. You know what I'm saying? Look, the oceans will continue to touch the tides of the, uh, of the shore and then go back to their place, Right? For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Yo, everything that's happening in heaven is happening because Christ <laughs> created that as well, right? And it's amazing. We have no idea what's going up there, on up there except for what the Bible makes plain. But when we get there, just like we're amazed by sunsets and mountain peaks and beautiful oceans, when we get there, it'll be like, yo, and we'll never stop saying, yo, this is amazing, right? Visible and invisible, right? So visible is what that naked eye can see, right? Everything that your eye can see, he created the You have a computer and a cell phone. A man created that, but who created the things that was necessary for you to be able to make it? Who gave that person the intellect to make that phone, right? Visible and invisible. Have you guys ever seen an emotion before? I mean, like the actual emotion that someone's feeling, not the result of what the emotion puts on your face, but have you actually seen an emotion? Have you actually seen a soul? Have you actually seen a spirit, <laughs> right? Think of all these things, visible and invisible. God has created all of these things. The invisible things that you can't see, he's created it all. We're talking about Jesus. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, government is established by God, right? Mm -hmm. So that they can bring order to the nations that exist. Now, though God has instituted government, Man gets in and tries to corrupt it, but guess who made it? God created it. And the thing about us as human beings is we always corrupt the things that God puts together. 
<laughs> we do. But this is why God always wants his word in front of our face so that the things that are corrupted can come back and be the way that they are supposed to be. Right? That are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, or the thrones of dominions or principalities or power. Right? Even though government exists, they have a certain amount of power. Certain individuals have a certain amount of power. But that power is only given by Christ. You guys remember what happened when Jesus went and stood before Pilate? Pilate said, don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or let you go? What the Lord say? The only power you have is that which comes from up above. The power that the Father gives or that he gives, that very power comes from Jesus alone. <laughs> He's the one who energizes it. And at any point in time, he can pull the plug on it and you have nothing, right? He is the image of the invisible God, the first one over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things, all things were created through him and for him. Why is this last part important? Oops, I think you got yourself on mute. Yeah, there you me? go. Yeah, y'all can hear me. Oh, yeah, right. I can hear you. Yeah. No. You're good. You're I can hear you. Hello. Can you? Hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right. So this last verse is where we're going to stop, right? All things were created through him and for him. Now, what does this have to do with me? First and foremost, look at these last four words. Him and for him. All things were created through him and for him. What does that have to do with you individually? Think about it. You were created, right? Mm -hmm. You were created through Christ's power. You were created through him and you were created for him. Your life does not belong to you. Your life belongs to Christ. Whether you are a believer or a non-believer, remember, you are part of that all things that were created. Through him and for him, there is not one human being that exists that was not created. Not one. Adam and Eve were born. They were created from the depths of the ground, right? All people were created through Christ and for Christ. So if you were created for him, be real with yourself and evaluate yourself right now in your life. Can you say that you have truly found what your purpose is and that you are living to fulfill that purpose, to glorify God? Can you truly say that in your heart of hearts that you seek to honor God with your life because you were created with that purpose in mind? Does it matter to you what Jesus thinks or what he desires for your life? Don't just shake your head and say, yeah, because you know what I'm saying? It's the right answer, right? Be honest with yourself because you have to meet Christ face to face one day. And it's imperative that we learn Number one, who he is, how powerful he is, his position and his rank over us, how we need to submit our lives to him. All that he's done, his history of all the things that he's done, his handiwork, his power and possibility. And then we need to look at ourselves and understand that we are not God, number one. Number two, we need to put ourselves in the position to be able to serve and honor Jesus Christ. Right? This is where we're going to put a pin and pause, okay? Next week, we'll pick up on 17 and 18, okay? We'll speak about his preeminence, him being the head of the body, okay? We'll speak about all of that that comes with that next week. Talk to me. 
Give me your thoughts. Give me your questions. I'm here. I'm listening. Okay. I got a question. How to me. Okay, so why is it exactly that God gave us free will, but then put the forbidden fruit? You know, that that's just my question. Just curious about that. No, that's a great question, man. So think about it like this, right? Mm -hmm. God gives us free will because God wants a relationship with us. Okay. Then we'll if be robots. Dated, huh? I heard something. I couldn't understand. I just said, I was just saying, then we'll be robots. That's man. You was finna use exactly. <laughs> you took words out of my mouth, right? Think about it, right? If you're okay. in a relationship with somebody, would you want to be in a relationship with a person who has their own mind and understanding, or would you want to actually be in a relationship with a person who just has no will of their own, who only loves you because they're programmed to do so, right? Or do you want somebody to love you because it's their choice to love you? That's a really good point. Yeah, you're right. I would want somebody that, you know, has at least their own mind to it. Yeah, it makes sense now. Sure. I see, yeah. And man, you know, and that's a powerful question. Good question, man. You know, you think about it, man. You know, not only that, but God wants us to be able to flourish. And he wants to see the very things that we can do if we stay connected with him, right? Think about it. A baby that comes into this world, you hold that baby in your arm, you have no idea what that baby's gifts, talents are. But all you know is that you want the very best for this child. You have no idea what their interests are going to be, what their hobbies are going to be. But you know that if God has blessed you with this child, in your heart of hearts, any responsible individual wants to be able to see this child develop and grow and get all of the benefits and do what's right, right? And so what you do is you set off on a mission to train this child, to teach this child, to love this child, to discipline this child, because you want to see the very best of what they can do, right? Now, God has instilled all of this in this particular individual, right? And, and God gives us himself. And it's God's great pleasure to bless us, but it's also God's great pleasure to sit back and watch us use the very gifts and talents with our own free will to do great things because he's invested us to do such a thing, right? You know, man, looking at how God does things for us is, is, is truly astronomical, man. And, and why he allows us to be able to be free to do these things. The only thing Christ wants us to be a slave to is righteousness, right? The only thing he wants us to be a slave to is righteousness. And man, you can see the Garden of Eden as a trial period in a sense as well, right? Mm -hmm. God gave them all of these things, right? Can you imagine, my mind wonders, what would have happened if Adam and Eve would have told Satan, nah, bro, you tripping. You go ahead and eat that fruit. God told us to fall back. And they stepped away and didn't do it. Can you imagine what life would be like right now? Probably beautiful. <laughs> That's no doubt. Yeah. That's no doubt. You know, I couldn't even tell you, but in my, my holy imagination, I'm thinking Satan will already be in the lake of fire right now, roasting, and we will be enjoying a life that words can't even explain. But... Mm -hmm. Christ wants us to love him on, on our own free will. So that's what it is. And part of loving God is uh, being obedient to what he's called to do, out us to do. You know, final example is think about, again, being in a relationship and your girl tells you, I don't like when you do that. Please don't do that, right? If you really love her and care about her, guess what? Whenever that thought even comes into your mind to do it, what you going to do? Nah, I can't do it. Baby, don't like that, man. I'm, I'm chilling. You know, you ain't going to do it because you love her. You care about what she cares about. And so, you know, um, we have to learn to just really love God in that sense. You know, he gives us that free will to illustrate our love for him by simply being obedient to what he loves, what he desires, and what he commands. And, man, life could never be more gravier than when we follow him. Hmm.
Yes, amen. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, thoughts, criticisms, anything? Drew, Zenobia, Sherelle, John John, Joseph. I thought you did really great, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. Glad to be a part of uh, your uh, Bible study tonight. And I'll blow it to the Lord, man. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah, definitely <laughs> truthful. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate, it, man. Hey, look, I, I, look, I just want, I just want y'all to grow, man. You know what I'm saying? And, and we can all grow together. You know, you know, be on one accord with the Lord. I don't want nobody else to try to mix y'all up. So, gonna come with it. Yeah, I mean, there's no more questions or thoughts, man. Look, all y'all. I think everybody got my number on here. I think Michael, you the only one that ain't got it. Matter of fact, Michael, I'm gonna put my number in the chat, man. So, okay, <laughs> sounds sounds good. Yeah, you can hit me up, man. I could when I'm texting everybody else, you can text me. I mean, I can make sure I include you in our messages. Bang. All right. All right. Shoot, man. Um, we'll meet back up again, man. Seven o'clock next Thursday. And uh, if y'all know okay. anybody who y'all think will benefit from it, I ain't invite them, man. Come on through and uh, okay. I paid for it now, so there ain't gonna be no interruptions. <laughs> man, <laughs> last week. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, hey man, much love to y'all. We're gonna pray it out. And uh say, man, if y'all got any other questions offline, holler at me. Not, I'll see you next week. Go to the Lord of Prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the day. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word of truth. And we thank you for helping us to make the picture clear about your son Jesus Christ. Lord, it is unfathomable, Father God. And it's quite baffling to our understanding that you, the one who spoke everything into existence, who created everything, desires to have a personal relationship with us. It's crazy to think about the fact that, Lord, that you love us so much that you would send your only son, Christ Jesus, to die simply so that you can live with us forever. Master, help us not to forsake the free gift of eternal life that you have given unto us. Help us to repent of our sins, to be honest and reflect on where we are with you, Master. Help us to turn away from all the things that we have said and done that has been displeasing unto you, Lord God. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, and help us to draw near unto you. We pray, Master, that any church that we go to or any teaching, Father God, that we come across, the Lord, it is one who is inspired by you and that they don't teach us heresy, Father God, but they teach us truth in a loving way, not with arrogance or cockiness, Father God, but with boldness and confidence in the assurance that you give through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to make Christ everything in our life. Everything, Master. The first, the middle, and the last, Father God. Thank you for just thinking enough of us, Father God, to want to even reveal yourself unto us. Lord, we just pray for our personal battles that we deal with from day to day lives. We know after we cut this Zoom call off, Father God, we have to go back to how we live. But Lord, let there be a change in how we live because we're including you in everything that we do. And we want to honor you with our lips, with our actions and our thoughts. Master, we love you. We just thank you. These and all blessings we ask of you in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Much love to y'all, man. If you Leave me, you know the number. Talk to y'all soon. Peace. Have a good night, everybody. All right. Have a good night. Peace.